Chapter 33 He slowed to a walk. As far as he could tell, nobody was chasing him. He could hear voices coming from back by the truck, but couldn't make out the words. Occasionally, he would hear the revving of the engine, but the truck wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. He headed in what he thought was the direction of Big Thumb. He couldn't see it through the haze. Walking helped calm him and allowed him to think clearly. He doubted he could make it to Big Thumb with no water in his canteen. He didn't want to risk his life on the hope that he'd find refuge there. He'd have to return to camp. He knew that, but he was in no hurry. It would be better to return later after everyone had had a chance to calm down. And as long as he had come this far, he might as well look for Zero. He decided that he would walk as long as he could until he was too weak to go any farther. Then he'd turn around and go back. He smiled and he realized that wouldn't quite work. He would go only halfway, halfway as far as he thought he could go so that he'd still have the strength to return. Then he'd have to make a deal with the warden. He'd tell her where he found Kate Barlow's lipstick tube and beg for mercy. He was surprised by how far out the holes extended. He couldn't even see the camp compound anymore, but he still kept passing holes. Just when he thought he had passed the last hole, he'd come across another cluster of them a little farther away. Back at the compound, they had dug in a systematic order, row upon row, allowing space for the water truck. But out here, there was no system. It was as if every once in a while, in a fit of frustration, the warden would just pick a spot at random and say, what the heck, dig here. It was like trying to guess the winning numbers in a lottery. Stanley found himself looking down into each hole as he passed. He didn't admit to himself what he was looking for. After more than an hour had gone by, he thought he had surely seen the last hole, but then off to the left, he saw another cluster of them. Well, he didn't actually see the holes. He saw the mounds of dirt that surrounded them. He stepped over the mounds and looked into the first hole. His heart stopped. Down at the bottom was a family of yellow spotted lizards. Their large red eyes looked up at him. He leaped back over the mound and ran. He didn't know if they were chasing after him. He thought he might have seen one leap out of the hole. He ran until he couldn't run any further, then collapsed. They hadn't come after him. He sat there a while and caught his breath. As he got back to his feet, he thought he noticed something on the ground, maybe 50 yards away. It didn't look like much, maybe just a big rock. But in a land of nothingness, any little thing seemed unusual. He walked slowly toward it. The encounter with the lizards had made him very cautious. It turned out to be an empty sack of sunflower seeds. He wondered if it was the same one Magnet had stolen from Mr. Sir, although that didn't seem likely. He turned it inside out and found one seed stuck to the burlap. Lunch. Chapter 34 The sun was almost directly overhead. He figured he could walk for no more than another hour, maybe two, before he had to turn back. It seemed pointless. He could see there was nothing ahead of him, nothing but emptiness. He was hot, tired, hungry, and most of all, thirsty. Maybe he should just turn around now. Maybe he had already gone halfway and didn't know it. Then, looking around, he saw a pool of water less than a hundred yards away from where he was standing. He closed his eyes and opened them to make sure he wasn't imagining it. The pool was still there. He hurried toward it. And the pool hurried away from him, moving as he moved, stopping when he stopped. There wasn't any water. It was a mirage caused by the shimmering waves of heat rising off the dry ground. He kept walking. He still carried the empty sack of sunflower seeds. He didn't know if he might find something to put in it. After a while, he thought he could make out the shape of the mountains through the haze. At first, he wasn't sure if this was another kind of mirage, but the further he walked, the clearer they came into view. Almost straight ahead of him, he could see what looked like a fist with its thumb sticking up. He didn't know how far away it was. Five miles? Fifty miles? One thing was certain. It was more than halfway. He kept walking toward it, although he didn't know why. He knew he'd have to turn around before he got there. But every time he looked at it, it seemed to encourage him, giving him the thumbs up sign. As he continued walking, he became aware of a large object on the lake. He couldn't tell what it was, or even if it was natural or man-made. It looked a little like a fallen tree, although it didn't seem likely that a tree would grow here. More likely, it was a ridge of dirt or rocks. The object, whatever it was, was not on the way to Big Thumb, but off to the right. 
He tried to decide whether to go to it or to continue toward Big Thumb, or maybe just turn around. There was no point in heading toward Big Thumb, he decided. He would never make it. For all he knew, it was like chasing the moon, but he could make it to the mysterious object. He changed directions. He doubted it was anything, but the fact that there was something in the middle of all this nothing made it hard for him to pass up. He decided to make the object his halfway point, and he hoped he hadn't already gone too far. He laughed to himself when he saw what it was. It was a boat, or part of a boat anyway. It struck him as funny to see a boat in the middle of this dry and barren wasteland, but after all, he realized, this was once a lake. The boat lay upside down, half buried in the dirt. Someone may have drowned here, he thought grimly, at the same spot where he could very well die of thirst. The name of the boat had been painted on the back. The upside-down red letters were peeled and faded, but Stanley could still read the name. Mary Lou. On one side of the boat, there was a pile of dirt and then a tunnel leading down below the boat. The tunnel looked big enough for a good-sized animal to crawl through. He heard a noise. Something stirred under the boat. It was coming out. Hey, Stanley shouted, hoping to scare it back inside. His mouth was very dry and it was hard to shout very loudly. Hey, the thing answered weakly. Then a dark hand and an orange sleeve reached up out of the tunnel. Chapter 35 Zero's face looked like a jack-o'-lantern that had been left out too many days past Halloween, half rotten with sunken eyes and a drooping smile. Is that water? he asked. His voice was weak and raspy. His lips were so pale they were almost white, and his tongue seemed to flop around uselessly in his mouth as he spoke, as if it kept getting in the way. It's empty, said Stanley. He stared at Zero, not quite believing that he was real. I tried to bring you the whole water truck, but he smiled sheepishly. I drove it into a hole. I can't believe you're... Me neither, said Zero. Come on. We gotta get back to camp. Zero shook his head. I'm not going back. You have to. We both have to. You want some sploosh? Zero asked. What? Zero shaded his eyes with his forearm. It's cooler under the boat, he said. Stanley watched Zero crawl back through his hole. It was a miracle he was still alive, but Stanley knew he would have to get him back to camp soon, even if he had to carry him. He crawled after him and was just able to squeeze his body through the hole. He never would have fit when he first came to Camp Green Lake. He had lost a lot of weight. As he pulled himself through, his leg struck something sharp and hard. It was a shovel. For a second, Stanley wondered how it got there, but then remembered that Zero had taken it with him after striking Mr. Pendansky. It was cooler under the boat, which was half buried in the dirt. There were enough cracks and holes in the bottom of the boat, now the roof, to provide light and ventilation. He could see empty jars scattered about. Zero held the jar in his hand and grunted as he tried to unscrew the lid. What is it? Sploosh! His voice was strained as he worked on the jar. That's what I call it. They were buried under the boat. He still couldn't get the lid off. I found sixteen jars. Here, hand me the shovel. Stanley didn't have a lot of room to move. He reached behind him, grabbed the wooden end of the shovel, and held it out to Zero, blade first. Sometimes you just have to, Zero said. Then he hit the jar against the blade of the shovel, breaking the top of the jar clean off. He quickly brought the jar to his mouth and licked the spluce off the jagged edges before it spilled. Careful, Stanley warned. Zero picked up the crack lid and licked the sploosh off that as well. Then he handed the broken jar to Stanley. Drink some. Stanley held it in his hand and stared at it a moment. He was afraid of the broken glass. He was also afraid of the sploosh. It looked like mud. Whatever it was, he realized, it must have been in the boat when the boat sank. That meant it was probably over a hundred years old. Who knew what kind of bacteria might be living in it? It's good, said Zero, encouraging him. He wondered if Zero had heard of bacteria. He raised the jar to his mouth and carefully took a sip. It was a warm, bubbly, mushy nectar. It was sweet and tangy. It felt like heaven as it flowed over his dry mouth and down his parched throat. He thought it might, it might have been some kind of fruit at some time. Perhaps peaches. Zero smiled at him. I told you it was good. Stanley didn't want to drink too much, but it was too good to resist. They passed the jar back and forth until it was empty. 
How many are left? He asked. None, said Zero. Stanley's mouth dropped. Now I have to take you back, he said. I'm not digging any more holes, said Zero. They won't make you dig, Stanley promised. They'll probably send you to a hospital, like Barf Bag. Barf Bag stepped on a rattlesnake, said Zero. Stanley remembered how he had almost done the same. I guess he didn't hear the rattle. He did it on purpose, said Zero. You think? He took off his shoe and sock first. Stanley shivered as he tried to imagine it. What's Maria la uh, ooh, asked Zero. What? Zero concentrated hard. Maria la oh, ooh. <laughs> I have no idea. I'll show you, said Zero. He crawled back out from under the boat. Stanley followed. Back outside, he had to shield his eyes from the brightness. Zero walked around to the back of the boat and pointed to the upside-down letters. M R Y U O U. Stanley smiled. Mary Lou, it's the name of the boat. Mary Lou, Zero repeated, studying the letters. I thought Y made the Y sound. It does, said Stanley, but not when it's at the end of a word. Sometimes Y is a vowel, and sometimes it's a consonant. Zero suddenly groaned. He grabbed his stomach and bent over. Are you all right? Zero dropped to the ground. He lay on his side with his knees pulled up to his chest. He continued to groan. Stanley watched helplessly. He wondered if it was the sploosh. He looked back toward Camp Green Lake. At least he thought it was the direction of Camp Green Lake. He wasn't entirely sure. Zero stopped moaning, and his body slowly unbent. I'm taking you back, said Stanley. Zero managed to sit up. He took several deep breaths. Look, I got a plan so you won't get in trouble, Stanley assured him. Remember when I found the gold tube? Remember I gave it to X-Ray, and the warden went crazy making us dig where she thought X-Ray had found it? I think if I tell the warden where I really found it, I think she'll let us off. I'm not going back, said Zero. You've got nowhere else to go, said Stanley. Zero said nothing. You'll die out here, said Stanley. Then I'll die out here. Stanley didn't know what to do. He had come to rescue Zero and instead drank the last of his sploosh. He looked off into the distance. I want you to look at something. I'm not. I just want you to look at that mountain up there. See the one that has something sticking up out of it? Yeah, I think. What does it look like to you? Does it look like anything? Zero said nothing. But as he studied the mountain, his right hand slowly formed into a fist. He raised his thumb. His eyes went from the mountain to his hand, then back to the mountain.